Welcome to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by United Poultry Concerns. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and if you go to our website, you can find all our past shows as well as sign up on our e-news list and find other ways to support us. And that site is hopefortheanimalspodcast.org. And you can reach me at my email, hope at upc-online.org. So we are at the end of April, and Earth Day every year is April 22nd. And wrapping up our Earth Day-themed podcasts for this month, our guest today on the podcast is Dr. Tushar Mehta, who is going to talk about regenerative grazing, which has become such a hot topic in environmental circles. It seems that environmental activists and local food activists really believe that if we just change the way that we are farming animals, that everything will be okay. And Dr. Mehta is going to help us to understand why that is not true and how we can counter these regenerative animal agriculture proponents. But first, I have an announcement about an upcoming event. It's our second annual Humane Hoax Chicken Webinar, sponsored by United Poultry Concerns and the Triangle Chicken Advocates. This is going to be on May 29th, 2021. And if you're hearing about this after the date, we will have all the speaker videos available on the same websites that you can register for the event, and those are humanehoax.org and upc-online.org. So we had the first ever webinar focused on chickens last year in 2020, and it was so well received and we're really excited to make it an annual event and do it again. Justin Van Cleek of Triangle Chicken Advocates is my co-creator, and we have some great speakers lined up this year, including, of course, Karen Davis, the founder and president of United Poultry Concerns. And Karen has a really fascinating topic that she's going to cover around suffering. And suffering is so often associated exclusively with pain, but as she points out in the description of her talk, while pain involves suffering, not all suffering involves pain. And she will explore the ways in which chickens can suffer physically and psychologically and the difference. So really fascinating stuff. And also Dr. Tushar Mehta, who is on the podcast today, will be speaking at the chicken webinar as well. He's going to be talking about the environmental impact of chicken farming. And we have other great speakers as well and a panel. So I'll give the websites again to register for this free event on May 29th. And again, if you're hearing this after that date, we will have the videos available on these same websites. So humanehoax.org and upc online.org to register for our second annual Humane Hoax Chicken webinar. I hope to see you there. I will put those links in the show notes. Also, before we get into our conversation with Tushar, I wanted to talk about an ugh, infuriating email that I received about a month ago because it relates to Earth Day and to our topic for today. And I think it's important to talk about I got this email from the Organic Consumers Association, and I've been on this email list for a long time. I know that they are not a vegan organization. They sometimes promote organic dairy or some other things like that, but I'm concerned about organics and I want to keep up with these issues, so I stay on the email. And most of their emails are just focused on that, on pesticides and GMOs and organic but this email was different. So there was an image of a burger at the top of the email, and it was basically a slander piece, a hate piece on the Impossible Burger. It talked about how Impossible Burgers have GMOs and they're not organic and they're not healthy for you. But then it started talking about how it's possibly going to put small organic beef farmers out of business. And I think this is really at the heart of it all. So I'm going to read some quotes from the email. And they talk about Gates and Brown. And Ethan Brown is the CEO of the company of Impossible Foods. And Bill Gates has invested in it. And so the email said, quote, 
you'd think Impossible Foods would focus on the horrors of factory farming. Instead, Gates and Brown have taken aim at regenerative organic agriculture and grass-fed beef. Well, yeah, because it's just as bad, if not worse, and I'm glad they're taking aim at it. And, and, and I'll note here again, as I have mentioned in previous podcasts, that being against factory farming is not necessarily promoting a vegan message now. Here they're separating factory farming from regenerative beef farming and are saying, you know, that we can all rally around the evils of factory farming, but hey, there's a better way. And it includes animal products. So vegans need to be very careful now when we're using the term factory farming or saying stop factory farming, because again, it's not necessarily a vegan message. I, I say that we just really shouldn't use this, this phrase at all anymore and instead say all animal farming is cruel or all animal agriculture is environmentally impactful or whatever is being said so that all forms of animal ag are covered because now the industry has really separated the two and we need to be sure that, that all animal farming is included in what we're saying. Anyway, so the email went on to say, this is another quote, quote, real climate activists know it's not the cow, it's the how. So again, there's this thinking that if we just tweak it, change it, change the farming methods, that all the detrimental effects of animal farming will somehow magically disappear. And another thing that really irked me in this particular part was that it said real climate activists know, like vegan climate activists aren't real climate activists. Ooh, really, really irksome. <laughs> they used terms throughout the article that described Impossible Burger as synthetic meat and synthetic frankenfoods, just synthetic, synthetic, making it sound just as bad as they could. And yeah, okay, it's not a health food. I think we can all agree on that. Sure. But of all the crappy foods that are out there, really? This is what you're going to target? So this product, Impossible Burger, it uses 87% less water than beef, 89% less greenhouse gas emissions, and 97% less land than beef. I mean, even grass-fed beef and regenerative beef could never have numbers that good. And actually, these alternative methods of grazing animals have higher land use numbers than conventional beef. And we're actually learning that grass-fed beef can create even more greenhouse gas emissions and use more water than feedlot beef. So it's just, it's, it's mind boggling that Organic Consumers Association would be demonizing such a highly sustainable product. Yeah, okay, it's not organic. It's got GMOs. But it's so much better in so many ways. And not only much better for the planet, but it's saving lives. It's saving animals' lives that are confined and tortured in animal agriculture. I mean, this product has so many benefits, is so, I would think, in line with what Organic Consumers Association ultimately wants on the larger picture of reducing the impact on the planet. Maybe a better approach would be working with them, trying to make the product better, how about a campaign encouraging them to use organic ingredients, to use non-GMO ingredients? But don't put a hit piece out on this product. I mean, that's what this email was. So there were links at the end of the email to other articles that were equally as infuriating. And one was called What You Should Know About Plant-Based Meats. And this was just basically a longer hate piece on all veggie burgers calling plant-based meats ultra-processed foods with industrial and laboratory manipulation. And they did the whole disparaging of soy, which has been thoroughly debunked. First of all, 
that's not all veggie burgers. There's a lot of veggie burgers and other plant-based meats that are organic and do have good ingredients and have no GMOs and are soy-free if you're worried about that. But let's look at what they're substituting. Meat, beef, I mean, it's not only much healthier than actual dead animals, no matter how processed the burger is, but it's also saving lives. And this should be our number one consideration. First and foremost, save as many lives as possible, as quickly as possible. And then we can work with them to make the product healthier. Ingredients can be altered, shifted, you know, to be healthier. They, they can go organic. So let's work with these companies that are trying to do a good thing for animals and for the planet instead of vilifying them. I'm so disappointed in Organic Consumers Association and what seems to be a campaign against plant-based meats. Another factor that I'll just throw in that, I, that I've really noticed with most vegans and plant-based meat alternatives is that they use these foods mostly as transition foods. And then once someone's been vegan for a few months or a few years, usually they only eat these foods sparingly, if at all. There might be some vegans out there who eat plant-based meats every meal, but I think for the most part... Beans and grains and pastas and veggies become the staple. I, I really don't think we need to worry about someone eating the Impossible Burger twice a day. <laughs> but even if, is it really worse than eating a beef burger twice a day? Well, I'll tell you who it's not worse for. It's not worse for the animals. It's not worse for the planet. So we should be encouraging these foods. It's also... Just so disappointing to see this promotion and endorsement of small-scale regenerative animal farming. Why not promote the most sustainable food, which is organic plants, going directly into the mouths of humans? But there is certainly this foodie, locavore culture that loves to include animal products that have been alternatively produced in some way. And they're just unwilling to face the reality of the detrimental impact of breeding and slaughtering animals for food, no matter how it's done. So let's hear from our guest today about why these new methods of animal agriculture are not the answer to the climate crisis and could create even more devastation. <laughs> For our guest today, we have Dr. Tushar Mehta, and he is an MD who practices emergency medicine and has also spent years practicing family medicine and addictions medicine. And Dr. Mehta participates in international health projects, having volunteered on an annual basis in rural India and now is working in Haiti. And he also co-founded Plant Based Data, plantbaseddata.org. It's an online database that collects and organizes the most important academic and institutional literature regarding the impact of plant-based diets on our health and the environment and food security. And he lectures on these topics and emphasizes the interconnectedness of human, animal, and environmental well-being. Welcome to the podcast, Tushar. Thank you, Hove. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. We're glad to have you. So why don't we start with a little about you? When and why did you go vegan? What got you interested in these issues and in also maybe in data and health and the environment? Tell us a bit about you. Yeah, I think my beginnings were visiting India as a child and starting with compassion towards humans because I saw so much poverty when I was a child and it had a deep impact on me and made me really think and wonder about the suffering of other people uh, or the happiness and well-being of other people too. So as I got older, I also became very sensitive to environmental issues as well as animal issues uh, as part of that same thought process. So, uh, you know, as a teenager, I became vegetarian and I learned about veganism, which was something that I didn't think I could do. But as I learned more and more about it over the years and got better and better 
at understanding uh, how to eat healthy and uh, all the different amazing foods that are out there. I, I became vegan for about 10 years. I'm vegan now. So there's definitely an ethical uh, component to that. But I also learned a lot about the health implications and environmental implications of plant versus animal based foods. And when I became aware of the vast amount of academic literature and data on the subject, I started collecting it and amalgamating it and putting it together to have a, have a very solid collection that I could share with other people. I met uh, Nicholas Carter, who uh, wrote a paper regarding animal agriculture and specifically uh, greenhouse gas implications. And I, I reached out to him and together we started plant-based data because we put our databases together and made them publicly available so that if other people are learning about this, this topic, it will save them a lot of time to find the most information in one place. Yeah, the best information. That's really great. And I do want to talk to you about that more. But I'd like to just acknowledge that I know you are a doctor, an MD, practicing MD, and you've been practicing during the pandemic, I believe. And I just wanted to ask you about that. How are you? Are you okay? How's how's that going? And uh, what that what has that been like? Well, I practice emergency medicine, so definitely amongst the group of people who are frontline workers. Yeah. And it was a huge challenge for not just emergency physicians, but the nurses, all the staff that work in emergency departments and throughout the hospital systems. It was a big stress and uh, a lot of sacrifice for, for many people. I, w I must say that people work really, really hard to adapt and learn and to face these challenges, even when there was risk to themselves. Things are improved now for us because we are vaccinated, but there's still a long way to go to get society back on track in our own countries, but also all the implications for the global poor and the poor in our own countries as well, even though there are developed countries who've been disproportionately affected. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that work. Of course, we all have a great deal of gratitude and new respect for frontline medical workers. So thank you so much for doing that work and keeping us all uh, healthy and safe. Oh, it's our duty. Again, it's, it's been a big teamwork project. A lot of people have stepped up and I'm impressed with all, all, all the medical community. So Tushar, I invited you here today to talk about the environmental impact of animal agriculture and specifically about regenerative animal agriculture, regenerative grazing. We're hearing so much about this now in from coming from the environmental community. Uh, so I want to talk about that, but first I want to start with the big picture, the bigger picture of what is animal agriculture's impact on the environment, because I think we really need to start with that, with the current impact and why there is a response and reaction from the animal agriculture industry trying to make animal farming more sustainable, because now it is being widely exposed that animal farming is very impactful on the environment. So can you start with the bigger picture, just maybe a little bit about what animal agriculture's impact is on our planet? I think that's a very good place to start. Most of the time, people don't understand the bigger picture and the major factors that play a role in global environmental problems. When I give a lecture on this, when I give a lecture about animal agriculture and the global environmental impact, that's a talk that I give frequently, we have to realize that there are now nearly 8 billion people on the planet. Very soon, we're going to be about 10 billion. And according to United Nations uh, data, by the end of this century, we can be about 12 billion, but there's a range, right? We may shrink down to less than 10 billion uh, towards the end of the century, or we may go up to 15 billion towards the end of the century, because there are different possibilities for human reproduction. So we have a huge population. And at present time, humans have altered 75% of the non-frozen surface of the earth in some significant way or another. For example, a small percentage maybe are actual cities and towns that we build, but implications in terms of the amount of 
environmental change through farming, through agriculture, through roads and ecosystem fragmentation, through mining, through pollution, many different ways that we've, we've impacted the global surface of the earth, 75% of it. But 50% of the earth's surface is basically used for agriculture. That's the single biggest impact on earth is agriculture. And the majority of that agricultural land, the majority of the alteration of the earth's surface is due to animal agriculture. Now, why does animal agriculture take up so much of the earth's surface and have this massive impact on the earth's surface? So the main reason that animal agriculture takes so much land is a concept called the feed conversion ratio. If an animal or a human is growing and eats a certain amount of protein, not all of that protein becomes incorporated to the muscle mass or the body of that, of that being, right? Much of it is used for metab metabolism, metabolism for energy, enzymes, other things, and only a smaller percentage is incorporated into the body. So if you take the most efficient animals of all and grow them in the most efficient manner, okay, let's say chickens and uh, it would, would be one of the most efficient animals, at the best, you can get uh, a feed conversion ratio of protein of three to one. You'd have to feed your chicken three kilograms of protein to get one kilogram of protein back that somebody may eat, unfortunately, okay? So that is not efficient. You're losing two thirds of that protein. That means to grow these chickens, you're gonna have to use at least three times as much plant protein as you could theoretically grow just for human consumption directly. You'll use at least probably three times or around three times more land, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, more water, more soil, more of everything, okay? So you're using more of uh, so-called resources to get a smaller amount of food product back. It takes far more land to produce a, a far smaller amount of protein. And that's why animal agriculture takes so much land. As such, animal agriculture is the biggest cause of global deforestation the biggest cause of wetland loss as we convert forests and wetlands into pastures or into croplands to then feed animals. You know, half of the world's crops are fed to animals. Probably a third or more of the world's grain is fed to animals. And because of grazing, grazing takes the single largest amount of land of any type of animal product and um, is, is the least efficient and the greatest cause uh, proportionately of deforestation, wetland loss, et cetera. Uh, in terms of ongoing losses, meaning new deforestation, new wetland loss, new environmental degradation as we expand animal agriculture, but also currently occupied land, land that is occupied that once upon a time was a forest or was a natural grassland or once upon a time was uh, a wetland, et cetera. So animal agriculture has the biggest land impact, the biggest water impact. It also has a huge climate impact. Grazing animals that ruminate or ruminant animals, even uh, if they're fed grains, they produce methane in the ruminating, ruminating process. If they are grazing, there's actually a greater amount of methane production. And as we know, methane is one of the most potent greenhouse gases. So uh, that's why animal agriculture has such a huge impact Animal agriculture has become this dominating force in terms of how we've used land and the sheer biomass of animal life on earth. Um, and uh, that's how it has a, such a massive impact. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And, and so because this information is now coming out, we're, you know, of course, environmentalists have known this for many, many, many years and decades, but finally the impact is being reported on and talked about in mainstream media. And so the industry is responding and you recently wrote an article that was debunking regenerative grazing. So regenerative agriculture, we're hearing more and more about this. It's really a hot topic. Regenerative grazing, it's it's definitely become kind of the darling of the environmental community when we're talking about food and their response to animal agriculture's impact. 
So can you first first explain what it is? And it goes by a lot of different names. I've heard rotational grazing and short duration grazing. I've even heard holistic management. So maybe starting by what what it is, what they're proposing, and is it greener? Why is this method probably not the green superstar that everyone wants it to be? So the different names that you uh, mentioned that regenerative grazing is called by are correct. They have all these different names. Multipaddock grazing is another one of the technical terms that is used. What they propose is that if we graze animals better compared to the conventional manner of grazing animals, that we would have better soil health on the grazing areas and more carbon will accumulate within the soil biomass. And therefore, uh, carbon from the atmosphere will be stored in the ground due to this improved grazing technique. And you will have then cattle meat that will be less carbon intensive. And that we may even, when they, when they uh, you know, go to their fullest extent of their arguments, reverse climate change through this process. Mm. Okay? And they're specifically talking about uh, cattle, which actually... Uh, are known to have the largest climate impact because the large land use change, you have to cause so much deforestation and that releases carbon, plus the methane emissions, et cetera, that come from ruminant animals. So they're looking at the, the worst climate emitters and saying how, oh, these animals can actually help solve climate change by better grazing techniques. That's what they are proposing. So there are a number of reasons why this is not true. This is kind of like the coal industry coming out and saying, oh, we have clean coal or the meat industry saying that, oh, we have humane meat. Mm -hmm. It's a misinformation campaign. It's a bending of the science. Mm. All right. To some extent, there's a little bit of truth. Okay. And they're manipulating that because if you have improved grazing, what, what, what do you do? What are the factors involved in, in these improved grazing? So if you look at the studies to improve grazing, which would improve the soil health, here's what they got to do. They have to have less number of animals per area of land. So instead of having so many animals on the land, which happens all over the world, and grazing is one of the major factors in desertification and stripping of all wild plant life from soil and soil erosion, grazing is a big factor in destruction of soil and, and climate emissions, et cetera. Instead of having so many animals, have less animals. So if, if you have less animals and you briefly graze in one area and then move to the next area and move to the next area without stripping the soil too much in any particular area, you will allow the grasses and other plant life to remain. And therefore, it will protect the soil. It will continue to be there and it will continue to have some, restore some carbon in the ground but it's only possible to store new carbon in the ground when you have land that is previously very degraded. So if you're starting with an area that's been very degraded by bad forms of agriculture, whether it's grazing or really poor plant-based agriculture, which has depleted the soil a lot, and now you replace it with a better form of agriculture that's easier on the land and allows more biomass to grow on the land and remain on the land, then that soil will start to regenerate, restore somewhat, and the plant life will draw more carbon into the ground, into the roots, and eventually decompose and become part of the soil matter. Okay. So I think the first point that we need to know is that improved grazing techniques are improved compared to what? They are better than the worst form of grazing techniques. So if you have the worst forms of agriculture and you replace them with so-called regenerative grazing, you will have some improvements in the soil and you will have some restoration of soil carbon. So it's better than the worst forms of agriculture, but it's not better than equivalent forms of plant-based agriculture. And it's definitely not better than rewilding. If you want to take land that has been damaged and you want to restore the most amount of carbon into that land and draw the most amount of carbon out of the atmosphere, the best thing you can do is rewild the land. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you're not just measuring the soil carbon that is increased. Rewilding land will increase soil carbon probably more uh, in most cases than best forms of so-called regenerative grazing. Okay. But you're also getting the total plant biomass 
that grows into trees and plants and roots. Uh, so above ground and below ground plant biomass. So rewilded uh, land, whether you're changing something back into a natural wetland or a forest or even a natural grassland, is far superior for the carbon storage point of view compared to regenerative grazing or even regenerative plant-based agriculture. Okay, Rewilding is always the best. These people try to conflate the fact that, you know, just by only showing you a part of the picture and not telling you the whole picture that, yes, it's better than the worst forms of agriculture. But in the bigger picture, we have to compare it to other forms of optimized agriculture, like optimized plant agriculture, and compare it to rewilding. The other thing that they don't tell you is that there's a limit to how much carbon you can store in the, uh, in the grazed area. They make it sound as if you can continually store more and more carbon indefinitely, but that's not true. There's a limit to how much carbon that you can store on grazing land, and it's going to come into an equi equilibrium. So the, the limit that you can get is a lot less than the equilibrium and limit you can store with rewilding. Rewilding can store much more, okay? So it's not an indefinite thing that every year that you're grazing in a better fashion, you can continuously store carbon to the ground. There's a limit and rewilding is gonna be far higher than that limit. People don't tell you about the impact on other animals in the ecosystem. So if there's wolves, predators, all kinds of animals that interfere with your grazed animals, then they will actively kill those off. And that's one of the major impacts. The other myth is that you need animals at all to store more carbon in the ground. So what you could do is have better forms of plant agriculture, as I already mentioned, and that will also restore a lot of carbon into the soil. At the same time, you can grow more protein on a smaller amount of land, and therefore using a much smaller amount of land, grow an equivalent amount of protein and other nutrients to feed humans, and therefore save a lot of land. So not only can you restore the land through better plant agriculture, restore the soil and store carbon, but you can also grow the same amount of protein on a much smaller area. And that allows rewilding and renaturalization of the saved land. And that is truly the most optimal thing to do. Yeah, it's it's true. I agree that it is it's it's frustrating to me because it is deceiving. It they're not telling you the whole story, the bigger picture that what could happen to this land is, you know, restoring and rewilding. And if we would encourage a plant-based diet, we wouldn't need this land to be used for animals. Uh, even though they may say, oh, it's a little better. They're not telling you what could actually happen, which is incredible improvement through re rewilding. So yeah, it's very frustrating. I, I totally agree that, you know, that's, it's deceiving. They're not telling the whole story. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of other things they get left unmentioned as well. They calculate the impact of methane over a hundred year time scale, which it's get, it gets complicated. Basically, it shows a lower impact of methane when you do that. Uh, ruminant animals, cattle, their main impact is through methane on climate change. That's one of their main impacts. If you lowball the methane numbers by sort of averaging them over a hundred years, then it gives you sort of better numbers. It makes the cattle look better. 20 years is actually more realistic because methane only stays in the atmosphere. Most of the methane will only stay in the atmosphere for about 12 years. So averaging the impact of methane over 20 years is, is a better way to go, actually. I know that's a bit, that will get a little bit more technical, but I'll just leave it at that. The other things that they don't say is that just the reality that places like the Amazon being deforested and the Cerrado and other tropical areas are being destro destroyed for animal agriculture, you know, in the environmental movement or on Netflix and, you know, on the internet, you're going to have these movies like Kiss the Ground and uh, Sacred Cow telling you these little stories on TV. When in reality, there's this whole scale destruction of these forests and displacement of indigenous people. And in fact, cattle grazing was one of the ways in which colonial people 
sort of destroyed indigenous peoples, right? They took up all these lands that were previously used by indigenous peoples. This was one of the major factors in this colonial process, which is now ongoing in the Amazon, right? So there's a huge human rights component to this too. Mm. And again, it completely neglected because people who promote regenerative grazing are so well able to make these very pretty looking movies with nice images, but really they're creating in those type of places, they create such a small amount of edible protein using such a large amount of land. Yeah. And we should remember that climate change is not the only problem. Land use and water use are bigger uh, problems even than climate change. And many times the environmental movement only looks at climate change or mostly looks at climate change without looking at these other parameters, uh, which are of such huge importance. So you talked about a specific farm, White Oak Farm, and they're very, they, they, they even have, I think, an education program for children and stuff. They're all about the regenerative agriculture, animal agriculture. So tell us about this farm, because you found some interesting information about the data that they're putting out. Tell us about White Oak Farm. So White Oak's pasture is a farm which purports this regenerative organic type of agriculture without using pesticides etc and having multiple species present on this farm like there's cattle there's pigs there's there's chickens and some other animals too and they present themselves as a family farm type of uh, scenario right something a little bit more traditional etc and general mills buys a lot of their products. For example, the the cattle products that come from there are bought by General Mills for one of their products that they market. So they're connected with- I just want to say it's the Epic, right? Yeah, they're Epic Beef Jerky. Epic Beef Jerky. And you see that at Whole Foods at the checkout counter. I see. Okay. So that's right. So that's the stuff. Now, so these guys are tied with mass animal agriculture. General Mills is, is mass, not just animal agriculture, but just multinational agriculture industry. That's General Mills. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now General Mills is one of the major funders of the study of White Oaks pastures, mm. as well as the beef checkoff program and some other things like that. Some of the people who worked on this study that was produced about White Oaks pastures actually work for General Mills and beef checkoff and so forth. Okay. Mm. And so this is a farm that's tied to the multinational agriculture industry and the meat industry and the study about these this white oaks pastures showing that they have some carbon benefits is is funded by these guys okay and then the results of that is then used to promote these products and promote the idea of uh, regenerative grazing etc what we found is that they're just doing the, the typical things they are not telling you that there's a limit to how much carbon you can store. One of the things that happens there is that they're able to store more carbon in the ground by fertilizing the ground. If you fertilize the land, then you have more amount of plant growth. And they sort of present it to you as, hey, this land is being fertilized by the animals. Animals are are grazing and pooping and then, you know, fertilizing the land and we're having better, better growth. That's one of the ways that they are saying that we are storing carbon in the ground. But If an animal is just eating from a piece of land and then pooping on that same land, you're just cycling the same nutrients. You're not giving additional nutrients for additional plant growth that will then store carbon in the ground. What they have is a huge amount of external feed that comes onto the land. So all the chickens that live there are fed by external feed. And so the chickens are fed by external feed and then all of their manure is then used as fertilizer on the farm that's an external source of fertilization coming from elsewhere, okay? And then fertilizing this land, which gives you carbon storage gains. As well, there's a certain amount of straw, a large amount of straw and hay that comes external from the farm to help feed the cattle there. Again, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients from that straw are eaten by these animals and um, then contributed to the soil. So it's actually not just these animals that are Uh, helping to restore carbon in the land there, they are actually having a a large amount of external nutrients put onto the soil through feed. Somebody may argue that these animals are eating that food and pooping it out, and it's that poop that causes fertilization. Well, in that case, 
remember that the food is from external sources. So you're transferring nutrients from another part of the land, which may be fertilized through chemical fertilizers, et cetera, that are now and transferred and onto this a land. Bunch of, a bunch of water. And uses, water. and uses, ex exactly. You're using water that's used from, you're using up land, deforestation, agrochemicals, fertilizers, waters, everything, yeah. and then transferring it onto this land. And you don't need animals for that transition process. For example, you can turn all those things into what we call green manure. They can compost it, et cetera, and then turn that into manure. And, and that would also help fertilize the land if you wanted to accelerate plant growth and accelerate carbon storage into the land. Or you could just leave the land alone and maybe seed it somewhat. That's one of the things they did. They seeded it with different kinds of grasses. Well, you can seed it with all the things that are native plants and native trees and allow that to grow, which would be even better. But the paper doesn't express the implications of all the external feed that comes onto the land and fertilizes the land, just as we mentioned. So those are certain, certain things that they're not telling you very plainly. They mention it like in a line or two, kind of as a side note, but they don't talk about it as, you know what, this is probably the major factor that actually allows us to increase soil health. The other thing that came out of the study is that it takes 2.5 times the amount of land to grow the same amount of food. Well, that's devastating. If you're only looking at carbon, and if you're only thinking about how much carbon that we can store in the soil, well, maybe it sounds good, but you're producing less food, right? Less edible protein. But if you're using 2.5 times the amount of land, that's devastating. And currently, people's environmental understanding is so limited that we only think about climate. We can't only think about climate. Climate is important, but we have to think about land use. We have to think about water use and the implications of that. So it, it just shows again that this, this increased land use is, is devastating. They're taking advantage of people's lack of knowledge and, and, and to show themselves as being better when they're actually not. So you mentioned it earlier, but I wonder if you can expand on it a little. One of the things that is an argument of these proponents of regenerative grazing is that you have to have large mammals on the land for it to regenerate, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen or it wouldn't be as efficient without the large ruminants on the land. What do you say to that? Again, they're feeding into this, um, or they're trying to promote this mythology. It's, it's very interesting. People came to the Americas or in Europe, and they basically annihilated a lot of the native animals and ecosystems that were there, replacing that with our farmed animals. If you look through North America, this study comes from North America, native people were devastated. Indigenous animals, the buffalo, were completely annihilated, and other large animals are annihilated all over the world, replaced with cattle. And then we go around saying that, oh, these cattle now mimic the animals that used to be here, right? And provide some of the same ecosystem roles as those animals did. But there's no evidence of that. The way buffalo eat, the way they migrate, all the different behaviors and ecosystem relationships that buffalo had, cattle are nowhere near. There's no evidence that cattle uh, do any of those things, maybe some of those things in a limited way. So there's this magical idea that cattle will eat and then their poop is somehow going to fertilize the land. But again, all you're doing is taking the same nutrients that were already in the ground, ingest them, and then poop them back. You're not adding any new nutrients. It's the plant growth itself that will just, if you leave the land alone, that will continue to absorb nitrogen from the atmosphere, continue to absorb uh, carbon from the atmosphere, and uh, continue to enrich the soil. And uh, rewilding the land will always enrich the soil more, enrich biodiversity more than, than cattle. And large animals uh, can be completely taken out of the picture and are not necessary. And there's the other thing too. And that is, I, I think it's, it's very difficult when you're talking to a technical audience. Um, they want to see things in a very, in a way that doesn't involve the idea of compassion. People are simply trying to make equations of, okay, what can I consume? What can I get for myself while having, you know, while having sort of my own maximum benefit and my own preferences satisfied, right? If that's people's way of looking at environmental issues, thinking like, what's in it for me? Then I don't think we're going to solve environmental problems. People need to think about the value of life. 
mm. the value of non-human life, the value of the environment, the intrinsic value and the intrinsic uh, right of all life to live. If we prioritize that, we're going to make different decisions than if we simply view the world as some as a set of mathematical equations that, okay, I can emit this much carbon, I, can, I want to eat this much meat, and uh, I can switch from this meat to this meat, and therefore satisfy my own food habits, and have this sort of selfish view of how we're going to solve environmental problems, rather than a view that recognizes uh, the importance of life, the importance of all life, and make decisions based on that. And I don't think we're doing that. So the importance of, I think, thinking in this, in this way will translate to different environmental decisions that will, will actually have a chance at protecting the planet. So something that confuses me is around the locavore movement or eating a more local diet and how this is very popular now and you see the local label on you know everything at the health food store and but it's such a meat centered or animal product heavy diet really i mean that they're very into local meats and local animal products and it just doesn't make sense to me because you need so much more land to breed and raise and kill animals compared to plant farming so so i i don't understand why locavores aren't natural allies to the vegan movement, really, because there's just not enough land to eat locally. Like if we wanted to eat locally, it would be much easier, much better to do it plant-based. So what what is the disconnect there? Why don't locavores recognize this dilemma and why are they so into meat? Yes, I think there's multiple factors at play here. But there's, again, a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding around this issue. Yeah. And there's a lot of bias in this issue as well. Mm -hmm. First of all, we do want to support local farming and local agriculture, and at least the best forms of it, right? And that's important. I, I, farmers are important. Having more farming integrated with our communities, people from cities participating in growing food and more aware of how food is grown and supporting local economies. These are all really, really important things. We're always going to have some food that comes from far away, but having a better locavore movement is going to be important. But we shouldn't oversimplify and think that everything has to come from locally. There's a very good study showing that if people ate locally, maintained the same kind of diet that they normally consume with meat and animal products, but sourced it all locally, there may be a certain amount of carbon savings. But if people just went you know, fully plant-based vegan one day a week, they would exceed the carbon savings from going local for seven days a week. You'd actually have far more carbon savings and less environmental impact just going plant-based a single day a week. And that doesn't speak to the fact that if people are sourcing some local meat, there may be animal-based foods that are grown with lesser impact elsewhere and transporting them over from far away may still be better than eating local meat. But even better than that is the plant-based foods, wherever they come from. As well, though, there's a lot of bias in this local vor movement. Part of this local vor movement originated in Canada, actually, and they're talking about then eating local meats, etc. while at the same time completely neglecting the fact that beans and lentils are actually local foods. Canada turns out to be the second largest producer of beans and lentils in the world. Hmm. And the people who were talking about the local vor movement who were Canadian completely neglected this fact. And it just shows you how biased, how extremely biased that these people were in the first place. And the same holds true for the USA. There's lots of beans and lentils that grow throughout the USA. Much of these are also uh, akin to indigenous foods. The, the three sisters, Aboriginal people throughout the Americas, in, in South America, Central America, North America, people grew the three sisters, beans, corn, and squash together. And these plants provided a complete nutrition package, and they each plant supported the other plant in various ways to make a very complete type of farming. The local war movement uh, has this, uh, much of it has a lot of bias, but I hope that's going to change. And that is changing, I think. 
So I want to ask you about your project, plantbaseddata.org. And I think this is something that is so critical right now because we seem to be moving into this post-data era where there's this distrust of facts, distrust of science, and it's 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 really dangerous. So why did you start this project? And tell us the importance of science around these issues. I think that science is crucial to understanding these issues. Unfortunately, science is often misunderstood or misused. Mm. When we're talking about these these things like the locavore movement or regenerative grazing, people try to selectively pick out certain bits of science and certain studies and then sort of spin them in the way that they want to to promote something that'll be a, a profitable to themselves. Okay, that's what's happening with this whole thing of regenerative grazing. Uh, maybe the locavore movement suffered from that to some extent. And, and that's a problem. What we really need is a more complete and comprehensive view of of multiple factors and the science around that. So science will play a role, but we have to use science and understand science appropriately. Plant-based data, in this case, is trying to amalgamate all this data. One of the challenges that people have are people are very siloed, right? Somebody just studies climate. Somebody just studies a certain aspect of climate change. Somebody studies some aspect of plant-based or you know pesticides used for certain things, right? Whatever it might be, people are in small zones. The idea of plant-based data is to to bring a lot of science together in one spot and make it easier for people to access the information. Now, it still takes a lot of work. You still have to go through there and read a lot of papers and read a lot of things to to learn what you need to learn about. That's unfortunately the process of, of understanding science, okay? It takes work. But if you just go out and Google and try to find information on things, it's going to take you a long time to accumulate and aggregate the different studies that you need and information that you need from United Nations sources, this, that, and the other thing. So here we've done a lot of that work for you. Anybody from the general public or policymakers, academics, students, activists, teachers, it's meant for you know people who want to access this information in a, in a more comprehensive, faster way for whatever their purpose is. That's wonderful. I think it's so important. And I really am so glad that you're doing this. What a great project. And uh, we'll definitely put a link in the show notes. And I really encourage people to tell others about it and share it far and wide, because we need this kind of critical thinking and uh, a good science to, uh, to bolster what we're, what we're talking about. Well, Tushar, I ask all my guests this, and I want to ask you too, what gives you hope for the future? That's a, that's a good question, Hope. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're in a difficult position right now. That on the one hand, uh, there are people who say, oh, there's no hope whatsoever. And on the other hand, there are people who say, oh, yeah, everything's going to be fine. We're going to fix everything. We're going to invent some technology that's going to fix everything. And I'm somewhere in between. There is definitely hope. There are a lot of things that can be changed, that can be turned around. There's a huge capacity for humans to learn, to do brilliant things, to work together and, and, and change the world around us. At the same time, there's a lot of potential for humans to be selfish and not look at the bigger picture of things, to take half measures that end up not accomplishing much. Things can go in, in many directions. So I believe that neither the worst or the best is inevitable. And what it's going to take is going to take a lot of teamwork to continue to learn, to educate ourselves, and to educate other people and to change the way that we do things, right? So we're, we're somewhere in between there. And there's a lot to be done. All right. So kind of half hope. <laughs> there's a lot of potential for the good and the bad and it, we have to work together yeah. to, to solve these to, to make it go towards the good side yeah and, no that that know. makes a lot of sense it's true and we're we're kind of at this crossroads that could go either way uh and it's uh we're really at an interesting place in history uh with the environmental impact in particular 
because of just how bad it could get or how much better it could get. And we're kind of at that place right now where we have to really make big changes and big decisions to uh, to make it better. So yeah, it's true. It could go either way. And the, and the human impact as well. People say very oversimplified things. Some people say, oh, you know, we may just wipe out all the humans and the earth will be fine. That's not true. Humans are tough. Nobody's going to wipe out all the humans that right. easily. That's a very, you know, it's an oversimplification to think that humans will just wipe themselves out. We will take most of their life you know, if, if that's what we're doing, we're going to take all the rest of life with us, you know, yeah, maybe you know, do the whales deserve to die because humans are wiping themselves out, you know, do all these other, uh, do all these other ecosystems deserve to be extinguished as humans wipe themselves out? Sure. Maybe 50 million years from now, you're going to have new ecosystems, but that's not the point. No. Life that is here now has intrinsic value yes. and its own right to survive. And, and that has to be recognized. Absolutely. And, you know, and I'm, I, I appreciate so much all that you do to help make that happen, to bring about that better, beautiful, healed world that we all want. Uh, and, and your data-driven information is so critical. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate all that you shared with us today. Uh, thank you for being with us, Tushar. Thank you for all the same things, Hope, and uh, looking forward to always working together. Thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast. Please help us to reach more listeners with these important topics by leaving us a five-star rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. I hope you enjoyed the Earth Day environmental-themed podcast this month, and I hope that Earth Day is a reminder and an inspiration to take your green living to another level, a darker shade of green, and make whatever eco-choices you can make. And remember that one of the most powerful things that you can do to reduce your personal impact on the climate crisis and so many other harms that face our planet is to live vegan.